Hi. Hi. If you don't know me, I'm Reverend Arpad. I'm a staff minister here. And uh, 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 I went blank there for a second. Judy goes, go ahead, go ahead. Okay, I'm here. My microphone's not on, huh? Dave did say project, right? You know, I love it when technology goes sideways. It's just like, what do you do? What do you say? How do you figure it out? Now, Dave's fingers are going like crazy all over the place. Yeah? How are we doing, Dave? Yeah, here's this one. Oh. The internet, not the room. All right. We'll tr Ooh, okay. <laughs> I'm excited to be here today. Number two, Father's Day is usually always around my birthday. And number three, our very own June bug is going to be 100 years old. Do you have any idea what that takes? Holy schmoly. The journey this woman has been on is outstanding. Now, if you're a Gemini, just stand up. I just want to see how many Geminis we have in the room. Uh, see? Yay, yay, yay. If you're over 80, stand up. Over 80, or 80 and above. Here are your next centurions in the making. So... Know that all the great sage, I think all the great sages in their in, the, in their lives, had a struggle between their humanity and their divinity. It was not easy for them to get where they got to go. It took time. It took practice. It took diligence. It took awareness. Now, do you know that in the Bible there's 30 years missing about Jesus' life? 30 years. So what do you think the guy did? What do you think he did for 30 years? He just shows up. Travel. Travel. Okay. You know, some of the scholars says he went out to pray. Okay. I could 30 years pray, but okay. And then there's other scholars that say he went to the Essenes and trained. Now, the Essenes is a Jewish mystic sect around 200 years old before B.C. and 100 years after. I guess that's not politically correct, but you know what I'm saying. So about 300 years. And they believed in baptism. You know, John the Baptist was a scene. They believed in predetermination, so God's will, no man's will, human will, that, does, that has no place in there because it's predetermined. And they believed in connecting to mysticism find a higher way, a higher source, a, higher, a better way to connect with God besides just words, practice. It took, now why do you think Jesus the Christ did this? Give me a guess. For humanity to learn. What do you think he could have learned? See, the three and a half years after he returned were the most grueling, challenging, difficult path he could have ever taken. And how do you prepare for something so traumatic? Because he, he knew what was happening, right? He prepared for 30 years. Now let's take another example. Siddhartha, also known as the Buddha. What do you know about him? Well, first of all, he was a person of privilege, royalty. He came from wealth. He came from good living. He had the finest clothes, the finest food, the finest teachers. But he, just like Jesus, had an awakening of some kind that told him that there is something better out there. There's something new out there. There's something that they both had to tap into. So what does the Buddha do? He leaves, goes out into the real world and experiences pain and suffering 
and poverty and all the things he'd never seen before. Because his whole life he was told what to believe. He was told through royal eyes what the world was like and never stepped out of the palace. You know, he sat under the Buddha tree, Bodhi tree, not Buddha tree, it's Bodhi, Bodhi tree, and sat there and sat there until he experienced awakening or reality. Now, think about that for a second. Can you sit under a tree for years, waiting for an answer? I know I can. Uh, here's a lesson that uh, the Buddha would teach his students, which I thought was very profound. So there was this man and his son, and they were very close, and the man had to go out on a business trip. So he uh, leaves and his son home. But while he's gone, this robber, this thief, whatever, whoever this person was, comes in, kidnaps his son, and burns his house to the ground. Wow. So when the businessman returns, and he finds that his house is totally burned to the ground, and there in the pile of ashes looks to be his son's bones. He was devastated. He didn't know what to do. But he gathered the ashes, put them in the vial and urn, and carried it with him wherever he went for years, on business trips, at home, wherever. And then one night, many years later, a young boy escapes from the thieves. And he finds out where his father's living, and he rushes over, he knocks on his door, says, Father, I'm back, I'm here, let me in. And the father wakes up out of a dream and says, No, you're dead. You're not real. You died a long time ago. But the son is going, No, no, no. I'm here, let me in, let me in, please let me in. And the father says, No, you're not real. And finally the boy gives up and leaves and never to return. So the Buddha says to his students, how many lies have you believed in that have become your reality? Think about that. Think about all the mistruths that you've experienced in your life, all the things that are not real, made them real, and that became your life experience. That's very profound. See, I think we need to challenge and question everything all the time. How else are we going to know what is true for us? I have this theory. Now, don't quote me on this percentage because I'm making it up, okay? <laughs> but I think that over 90% of the things you know in this world you have not had firsthand experience with. Okay? You read about it. You watched a travel blog in Tahiti about what the world was like, okay? But you never went there. And I'll tell you a funny story about Tahiti. So when my wife and I went on our honeymoon, this is a few years back, almost 50 years ago, uh, we rented a little moped, and uh, we were driving around the, the island, and we came across a little elementary school. So we stopped and we went in and noticed that the kids were still in session. And we noticed on the walls that all their paintings were in red and orange. We go, wow, that must be a cultural thing in Tahiti. It must, must have some cultural significance. It must be really cool. And the teacher saw us and said, come on in. Come on in. So we talked to the kids and we mentioned the cultural significance of the paintings and we asked her about it. She goes, oh, no, no, no. We ran out of blue and green three <laughs> months ago. This is all we have left. <laughs> but the point is, is that had we not talked to the teacher, our reality would have been, oh, the Tahitian culture likes red and orange. And I would have lived with that, and I would have been happy with that. You know, it would have been a good, who cares? It's my reality. 
but the truth makes the difference. So I want you to question religion. I want you to question science of mind. I want you to question the news. The news is not unbiased. Are you crazy? It doesn't matter if you're Republican, Democrat, Independent. The news is biased. It's presenting a point of view under the disguise of being neutral. And then your reality is connecting to it and going, oh, yeah, they're right. Because you think they're right. I had an experience when I was in uh, Hungary when the Russians were still there. And something happened in the United States. I can't remember what it was. Some news event happened in the United States. And when I went over to Hungary to visit my family, that same news event was being reported. But it was not what I saw. It was not what I heard. And I go, how is this possible? I, this is how I experienced it. But the Hungarian news was reporting it differently. That was my first inclination that, whoa, we're going down a slippery slope here. So question everything first, OK? Question your philosophy. Question the books you read. Question, question your neighbors. So let me ask you a question. Who can tell me their first experience of reading a book or doing something where you knew that there were other possibilities in the world. Other possibilities. And you went, whoa, is there something more? My first book was Ruth Montgomery. Now, I don't know if you know who Ruth Montgomery is, but she was a very famous uh, journalist for many years. You know, I think she was born in 1912. June, is that? Uh, <laughs> she was born in 1912. And she went from being a journalist, which is based on facts, to writing about things that we don't talk about. Past life regression, uh, mystics, uh, angels, guides, aliens. But there was something inside of me that knew that there was some truth in what she, what she was writing. But I didn't know what the truth was, but it resonated with me. It was a feeling. It was something that made me go, huh. So who, who can say something? Who, what did you read? Was it Celestine Prophecy? Was it uh, Conversations with God? Was it uh, The Secret? Secrets have made us famous. Celestine Prophecy. Conversation. Anything else? Emerson. Emerson. This, thing called you. this thing called you. Holmes. So think about the, the lineage. Emerson, 1887. Okay. When's Holmes born? He was born in 1887. Emerson was before that. Then we had Edgar Cayce. Great psychic mystic. Uh, when was he born? 19. Each one of these people built on top of the person before. And Ruth Graham Murray, Montgomery was one of the newest. So, what was the truth that you found? What was inside of you that you knew that was different? See, when I first came to religious science, I liked the language the words, the thinking, the philosophy of putting it all together. You know, I was an ex-ultra ex boy. I've told you this before. <laughs> That's a whole separate story. But traditional religion is, was based on fear. It makes sense. It's based on fear. You know, something's bad out there. If that bad thing is uh, making you do things, the devil made me do it. Now, I've got any devil believers? Anyone? Because I don't believe in the devil. But I'll tell you what I do believe in, and it's a modern version of that, is the ego. We can all relate to the ego because 
That is that big, loud voice in your head that's saying, come on, you don't deserve this. Come on, you don't want this. Come on, you're not good enough. Gentle, quiet voice is spirit. It's God. It's your higher wisdom self talking to you. You know, like, did you ever imagine driving a sports car really, 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 really fast? But you're looking in the rearview mirror. It's destined for disaster, isn't it? Destined for disaster. Because we're not, we're not moving towards the future. The ego wants to keep you in the past. The ego wants to keep you in the past. And in the past, you have memories. And if it can hold on to these memories of yours, you can never, ever, ever change. You can never move forward. You can never be your best self. Or suppose you're driving a high speed boat. You know those cigar boats? You know, they're going so fast, their nose is in, in the air, and, the, and it's making a lot of noise, and as it's going through the water, there's this huge wake behind it, right? You know what I'm talking about, right? So, you look behind you, you see the wake. That's where you've been. Can the wake drive the boat? No. Who's driving the boat? You. What's the person driving the boat doing? Going to the future. Okay? If you're looking at the wake, that's where you've been. The future is here. The moment is now. All right. It's going to take time for you to rise, to jump up and be something better than yourself. Just like the sages, it took time and it took practice. It didn't happen overnight. You can't let the ego control you. You can't let the ego drive your boat. You can't let the ego pull you down because that is not who you are. You know, we, we, we're told that God is in everything, everywhere, every possible place, everything, every surface. Science is proving that. Science is saying, hey, hey, what are you yawning over there? What are you doing there? Cut that out. <laughs> science is telling us in the atom, it's not solid. Hell no, it's not solid. It's there's space in that tiny little atom. And the electrons, the neutrons, there's space. These chairs, are they solid? No, but they're energy. And I, I'm going to move on to something different. My friend Dave back there always says, hey, Arpan, I noticed there's a pattern in your talks. Oh, yeah? He goes, what is it? He goes, yeah, there's always a meditation at the end. I go, yeah, there is. You know why? I didn't answer him. <laughs> the reason I always have a meditation at the end is because my goal is for you to get out of your head and stop thinking about what you're told and get into the feeling level of what you experience because that's the only way you're going to know the truth. Experience, feel. Embrace. Reading is good. It gets you closer. But unless you feel it in your heart, in your gut, it's not going to happen, in my opinion. Now, does anybody have a different opinion? Do you think that feeling is important? Okay. So, if we could, where is John Henry? Did he leave? Hey, Mary, can you just play some uh, meditation music? It's okay. So, just uncross your legs. Put them down on the floor. Oh, here he comes. Ah, 
the man, the legend, the magical fingers. So if you could just start playing. Just take a deep breath in and exhale. Feeling the energy swirling around your head, your shoulders. Feeling more relaxed, more at peace. Breathe in and exhale again, feeling that swirl of life, of consciousness, of love swirling around your solar plexus. Feeling more relaxed, more at peace, feeling more love. Take one more deep breath and exhale. Feeling more and more relaxed. Comfortable, warm, confident. And feel that energy swirling around your feet, going down through the ground to Mother Earth. As you find your special place in your mind, know that there is only love. Only love. Love transcends all things. It makes the sun shine and the flowers grow opens our heart. We are blessed and we are aware. Just take a look at where you've been. Look at your life. Ask yourself, what has been holding me back from rising, rising to the top? What has been holding back from speaking my word? Just ask yourself. What is there for me to do? We could be a hundred years old, we can be 16 years old. Spirit will talk to us and take care of us and guide us. So we can move on to be our best selves. Just say thank you, God, for anything that may have come to me. Any morsel, any big words, any feelings. And just bring it back with you to this room.
And as you become more aware and alert, three, become more comfortable and present, two, and you return to this room fully connected to spirit, one. Now, I know that was a very long of a meditation. But if something came to you that you weren't expecting, be brave. Rise up. Share it. I know it's personal. That's okay. All right. So, my point is this. Question. Trust God. Connect with Spirit. Find your personal message of how to communicate with Spirit in a way that you understand it, that you recognize it, and that you can believe it. And so it is. All right. We did a meditation, but we could do a prayer too. Yeah? Okay. Just know with me right here and right now that God is all there is. God is all there is, and until we believe that, we cannot move forwards. We cannot rise to the top. We cannot shout from the hilltops. God is in us, through us, as us, and is us. And I release this word to the universe. I know that everyone here will be transformed by their own personal journey. And I say thank you, God, for every individual that is here choosing to be here, awake, alert, and loving. And together we say, and so it is. All right.